The topic on which I'm going to speak is the existential crisis of imperialism. Why do I call it an existential crisis? What is the difference between the crisis of imperialism at this moment and the crisis of imperialism in the past? I believe that imperialism has never faced a crisis as serious as it is facing today, even though this is something where there is no world war, where there is no enormous kind of struggle you can see, but nonetheless, it's a crisis which is far more serious for imperialism than any it has faced in the past. And this is so for two reasons. Firstly, that this is a crisis from which it is difficult for imperialism to maneuver itself out. All previous crises it faced were crises in which it was possible for it to in fact maneuver itself out, possible for it to find some way of coming out. But this is a crisis from which there does not appear to be any way out. The second reason why this is different from previous crises is that all through, while imperialism has faced challenges from anti-colonial struggles, from struggles of national liberation, it always had, if not explicitly, at least implicitly, the support of the metropolitan working class. The working class in the advanced capitalist countries were never rising up at the same time that you had enormous anti-colonial struggles or struggles of national liberation movement. When the Vietnam struggle was going on, it's not as if there was a simultaneous dissatisfaction as far as the American working class was concerned vis-a-vis -vis American capitalism. That is not the case today. Today what you have is in fact an anger not only in what is called the global south, what we used to call the third world, not only is there an anger in the third world against imperialism, but there is also an anger among the metropolitan workers, among the advanced country workers against the hegemony of metropolitan capitalism. For instance, if you take the earlier serious crisis that imperialism faced, that was immediately after the Second World War when there was a spate of anti-colonial struggles all over the world, national liberation movements all over the world. When those national liberation movements occurred all over the world, imperialism was forced to go in for political decolonization. It gave independence. It gave the independence to India. It gave independence over time to many countries, Southeast Asia and so on. But at the same time, Within a very short period of a decade or two, what imperialism did is that it actually re-established its hegemony over this third world by taking to its side the elites of the third world societies, the bourgeoisie, the prosperous middle classes and so on, and with their help, it in fact introduced a neoliberal capitalist order, a neoliberal international order, a neoliberal uh, economic regime, which had the support of the domestic bourgeoisie and the domestic elites, and also it facilitated imperialism. It re-established in many ways the hegemony of imperialism over these societies, this time exercised together with, in alliance with the local bourgeoisie and the local elites. Why do I say that it established the hegemony of 
imperialism over the third world societies. What does this hegemony consist of? Why does imperialism need to establish any hegemony? There are a large number of commodities which the advanced capitalist countries, the imperialist countries, cannot either produce at all or cannot produce in sufficient quantities or cannot produce all the year round. They, but they cannot do without these commodities. These commodities, therefore, they import from the rest of the world. These commodities consist above all, of course, of minerals, oil and other minerals. And they also consist of agricultural commodities, fibers. We know that the industrial revolution in Britain occurred in the cotton textile industry. But Britain grows no cotton. So how is it that you actually had the industrial revolution <coughs> in a commodity that Britain doesn't grow? Because that commodity was imported from outside. Therefore, fibers, beverages, food commodities, etc., are things which imperialism cannot grow, but it requires from outside. Now, these commodities which imperialism cannot grow, but requires from outside, are commodities which also are inelastic in their supplies. Their supplies cannot grow. Many of them are produced by land use on, on, on agri in agriculture through the use of land area. The land area is fixed. You cannot keep on growing more by drawing more and more land into cultivation. Therefore, the supplies of many of these commodities is in fact itself fixed in the world. That it can grow, but it can grow only relatively slowly. But if imperialism requires these commodities, then these commodities have to be obtained by reducing the use which is being made by the local populations in many of these countries. This is a problem which English classical political economy, before Marx, David Ricardo had in fact noted he had noted that because of this problem, capitalism would come to an end, that basically profits would disappear and you would find that capitalism would get stuck in a stationary state, a state of simple reproduction, no growth is possible. But as a matter of fact, that has not happened and that has not happened because all over the world, people's consumption of these commodities their absorption of these commodities is squeezed so that more of them can become available for, the, for, the, for use, for consumption, for absorption in the metropolis. Now, this is something which happened in the colonial period through the system of taxation. The colonial government taxed the peasantry so heavily that the peasants' consumption really was squeezed. Famines occurred in India for a very long period of time. It was punctuated by heavy famines and therefore colonialism was a system of taking these commodities out of countries like India that grew them and taking them to the metropolis. They used to be taken to Britain and from Britain they would be exported to other countries, the continental Europe and so on. Not only was colonialism a situation where these commodities, supplies became available to the metropolis, but actually under colonialism they became available free because the tax proceeds, the peasants were taxed and the tax proceeds were simply used to take these commodities for their own use. Therefore, Colonialism was a very advantageous system as far as capitalism is concerned. But colonialism ended. If colonialism ended because of anti-colonial struggles that I was talking about earlier, in that case, how does the neoliberal regime achieve this? Suppose it is the case that suddenly there is a rise 
in the demand for let us say a uh, food grains if there's a rise in the demand for food or or some other food articles and if there's a rise in the demand for for these food articles then the supply of food articles cannot rise there'll be a rise in prices the moment there is a rise in prices under a neoliberal regime you would have control over inflation and control over inflation under neoliberalism takes the form of what is called imposition of austerity that means the government cuts back its expenditures employment is reduced interest rate rises because of which employment is reduced and of course this reduction in employment and the reduction in the wage rate that comes about because because of the rise in unemployment this basically implies that society's consumption goes down in societies of the third world consumption or absorption of commodities goes down and these commodities in turn become available for the metropolis so neoliberalism was a uh, uh, from their point of view a beautiful system nobody can notice that there is anything wrong with it but at the same time it ensured that commodities were made available to the metropolitan centers by squeezing the consumption levels absorption levels of the local population that neoliberalism achieved what colonialism had achieved but without any direct political control but that neoliberal regime is now in a crisis and i'll try and explain why there is a crisis neoliberalism the neoliberal regime has a certain set of characteristics the first is relatively free flow of goods and services across country borders the second is relatively free flow of capital across country borders and the third is relatively free flow of finance across country borders you see cap when we talk about capital we must always distinguish between capital in production if an american company comes and sets up a factory in india that is mobility of capital but that is capital that is productive capital that is used for production but on the other hand if capital comes from america to india but takes the form of finance they some americans come and deposit money in our banks or they come and invest in our stock market there is no physical capacity being produced it's not capital in production but capital as finance the 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 remarkable thing about capital as finance is that it it can disappear in a moment today it has come in tomorrow if someone makes a telephone call then millions of rupees would be taken out of banks and taken to america would be taken out of the stock market and taken to america therefore the significance of financial inflows and the significance of inflows of production capacity productive capital is not the same we must distinguish between the two to but then that is the hallmark that is the characteristic of a neoliberal economy now what has happened during the period of neoliberalism is that a certain amount of capital got relocated i am talking about productive capital a certain amount of productive capital got relocated american companies instead of setting up factories in america set up factories in china in vietnam in indonesia in india in bangladesh and so on therefore you had a relocation of production and what was that relocation of production it was really producing in the third world where the wages were low in order to sell in the world market instead of producing in america where the wages are high to sell in the world market you produce in bangladesh where the wages are low to produce to sell in the world market you have a higher rate of profit now this had never happened in the past but this happened on a big scale during the neoliberal period now let's look at the impact of this 
if capital can get relocated from America to the third world, from Germany to the third world, from Britain to the third world. In the case of India, by the way, the relocation was not so much for manufacturing as in services. All these call centers which have come up, that is relocation of service activities from the advanced countries to the third world countries, to India. So if you have this relocation of activities from the advanced countries to the third world, then what are the implications? The first implication is that the advanced country workers cannot get wage increases. If they go on strike demanding wage increases, then the company against which they have gone on strike, the company would say, oh, you are going on strike. We are going to locate our plant in Bangladesh. We are going to locate our plant in Indonesia, in Malaysia. Therefore, relocation basically means that the workers in the advanced capitalist countries have a disadvantage that they cannot raise their wages as they like, even when labor productivity is increasing, wages do not rise. As a matter of fact, Joseph Stiglitz, who is a well-known economist, made a calculation of the average real wage of a male American worker in 1968 and compared it to the 2011. And he found that the real wage of the male American worker in 2011 was slightly lower than it had been in 1968. So during this entire period, I'm, I'm not saying it kept falling or remained stagnant. It had gone up, but it came down. So during, over this long stretch of time, real wages of the American worker, average male American worker, had not increased. But productivity increases. Labor productivity is increasing all the time. So if the output per worker rises, but the wage rate per worker does not rise in real terms, then that basically means that the surplus per worker rises. That means an increase in the share of economic surplus in total output in the United States. Exactly a similar situation happens in the third world countries. Because here, even though you have relocation of activities here, the labor reserves which are created by de-industrialization in the colonial period and have continued growing, those labor reserves do not get used up. They do not get exhausted. Here, massive unemployment still continues. They have, and, and it continues for two reasons. Firstly, that the rate of growth of productivity is very high. Even if you have in India, let us say, 8% GDP growth rate, and if you have 7% rate of growth of labor productivity, then the rate of growth of employment is only 1%, 8 minus 7. And if your workforce is growing at 1.5%, that means that your employment is growing at a lower rate than your labor force. Unemployment, therefore, is increasing in terms of relative size. So the first reason why the labor force does not get exhausted is that you find that there is a significant increase in labor productivity. The second reason is that neoliberalism means a change in the attitude of the state because we have nation state, we have an Indian state, we have a Polish state, we have a British state, we have a, a Hungarian state. But on the other hand, capital is globalized. Finance is globalized because it can go from one country to another at a phone call. Therefore, you have the nation state facing globalized finance. When that happens, the nation state is more or less compelled to act in ways that globalized finance wants it to act. Otherwise, it will quit the country. It will leave the country. And if it leaves the country in a large mass, in that case, the country would be caught in a financial crisis. Therefore, 
there is a change that takes place in the nature of the state whenever you have a country being caught in a neoliberal regime. What does this change consist of? Earlier, the state was supporting peasant agriculture, it was supporting petty producers, it was supporting handloom weavers, it was even, it had legislated in favor of working class little bit of, of, of uh, regulating the conditions of their work. But when neoliberalism is dominating an economy, when the state is now more or less forced to do, act in the interests of globalized finance, then you find that finance wants the state not to do all these things for the peasants, for the petty producers and handloom weavers and so on, but basically to improve the conditions that are within which finance itself operates. So there's a withdrawal of the state from all these supporting activities. This is visible in India. You find that, for instance, input subsidies have been cut down. The Modi government wanted to carry it further forward by even cutting down the support price regime. That fortunately, because of the peasant agitation, it had to move back. But basically, a number of things. There is no support price regime now for cash crops. There's for food grains we have, but not for cash crops. Which is why you find massive drops in cash crop prices. I don't have to say this in Kerala. Rubber prices have collapsed. And there is no support regime as in the earlier system when you had various boards, tea board, coffee board and so on, which used to buy up these crops to provide some kind of a support to the farmers. All that has been abandoned, at least as far as the central policy is concerned. The state government would do something, but generally the system has been dismantled. So the state withdraws its support from petty producers from peasantry, and this gives rise to what Marx had called a process of primitive accumulation of capital. That these petty producers, peasants and petty producers of various kinds, and loom weavers, they basically cannot survive anymore. Their profitability drops becomes negative. They take loans from money lenders in order to keep their noses above water, they can't pay back the loans and therefore they become destitute. Many of them commit suicides and of course that is a process of primitive accumulation of capital. Others who don't commit suicide but in fact remain, they then join, they go to the towns, they migrate to the towns in order to uh, find some employment. Earlier, we were having this talk on cinema, though because I mean, was basically that, you know, of a, of a, of a, of a peasant migrating to town. So this migration to towns, in fact, between 1991 and 2000 cens, what, 2011 census, the number of cultivators in India has dropped by 15 million. Some may have become laborers, others have just migrated to towns. In the towns, there are no jobs, and therefore they swell the ranks of the reserve army of labor. And for this reason, the labor reserves in third world countries don't rise, because of which the wages here don't rise. What is more, you actually have not just no rise in wages, but you actually have impoverishment. People experiencing absolute poverty because of the fact that many of them have been driven down from being peasants, from being petty producers, from being weavers and so on, to becoming job-seeking workers. You would have come across lots of talk about how so many millions have been lifted out of poverty. Complete nonsense. Not a word of it must be believed as a matter of fact you find that the proportion of the rural population that cannot afford 2,200 calories per person per day, which was 58% in 1993-94, has gone up to 68% in 2011-12, and in 2017, 
17, 18, it was so bad that the government withdrew the data. Those data are not published. But whatever was available briefly, from that it turns out that it is close to 80%. So, it, not surprising that in India we are now 107th out of 121 countries in terms of the hunger index. So, there is, an in, there is not only no rise in wages, but an increase in poverty and destitution. As far as the third world is concerned, India is not an exceptional case. So that being the case, taking the world as a whole, the working people, the peasants, the workers, the petty producers, taking the working people as a whole, or what Lenin had called working people, that is workers and peasants, their living standards don't improve. But labor productivity rises, we know that, that our GDP has grown at a high rate. That means the share of surplus in output rises. This surplus accrues to capitalists, this surplus accrues to all kinds of persons who are, let us say, hangers on of, on the capitalists, lawyers, advertisement firms, and so on and so forth. All right, so. Taking the world as a whole, not only in the north, global north, but also in the global south, there's a rise in the proportion of surplus in output. And this shows itself in terms of an immense increase in class inequality. If you look at the workers in Britain, in France, in Italy, in Germany, their share of income has gone down. If you look at the workers, or workers and peasants in societies like ours, their share in total GDP has gone down. Now, if it is the case that there is a rise in class inequality, it is natural that there would be resentment among workers, particularly among advanced country workers, who generally found that their wages used to rise together with labor productivity. There is this is a controversial subject, but, but there is no evidence to show that there had been a reduction in the share of wages of advanced country workers in the period before neoliberalism got introduced. With the introduction of neoliberalism, roughly, let us say, from the 1970s onwards, you find that the share of workers has gone down greatly both in the global north and in the global south. Working class anger, in Britain for instance, the Brexit vote, that British workers decided that we are not going to be part of the common market. Why did they say, do, say that? Because of the fact that there was a resentment, there was an anger because of their wages not rising even as labor productivity was increasing. So, one, the fundamental reason why now against imperialism you have an anger not just within the third world but even in the first world is because the neoliberal regime's dynamics is one which raises the share of surplus at the expense of all workers both in the first and in the third world. When this happens, something else also happens and that is this. That suppose you take a rupee from a worker and give it to, let us say, some Supreme Court lawyer. Now the worker would be consuming more or less this entire rupee. You give it to a lawyer, you, 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 you give it to some person who lives of the surplus, in that case, that person would not consume the entire rupee, may consume 50 paise and keep the remaining 50 paise in his pocket for future consumption. And that is what economists call saving. So he would be saving a part of the money that comes to him, but consuming only a part. But the worker would have consumed all of it. Therefore, every such redistribution of income from the workers to the surplus earners is a redistribution that lowers consumption. If it lowers consumption, it creates a problem of insufficient demand. It creates a problem of overproduction. It creates a problem of crisis. It is that crisis 
which has manifested itself that crisis was kept in check for a while because of what is called asset price bubbles there was there were speculative bubbles in the stock market in america because of which many people thought they had become very wealthy they started consuming so that is separate from their consumpt from their income based consumption so you have therefore the moment the bubble burst the moment the housing bubble burst in the united states you have all over the world a crisis that has set in even bourgeois economists even establishment economists are actually calling this a period of secular stagnation that capitalism they say has entered a period of secular stagnation what does stagnation of capitalism mean it means of course that output doesn't grow or grows at a very slow rate but most importantly it means a rise in unemployment because even as output doesn't grow labor productivity continues growing if not exactly at the same rate at some rate because of which you have lower employment in fact negative rates of growth of employment so the working class or the working people all over the world this is exactly what has happened in india in india we really our unemployment is of a very peculiar kind it's not as if some people are fully employed some people are fully unemployed it's the case that somebody may actually get 4 hours of employment in a day but not for the rest of the day somebody may get no employment today but some employment tomorrow therefore employment is rationed out among the among the labor force and that being the case the amount of employment per worker tends to go down so this is something which is happening in the advanced countries this is something which is happening here therefore already i was saying a feature of neoliberalism was greater distress as far as the working class is concerned as far as the working people in the third world are concerned but the distress becomes even greater because of the crisis as a result of which now there is acute distress among the workers all over the capitalist world whether in the first world or in the third world now the remarkable thing is against this acute distress the governments cannot do anything why not for the government i mean you may say that the government can boost demand the government can spend if it is the case that consumption demand has gone down the government can spend more uh, in 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 making social consumption available it can build more roads it can build more ports it can build more airports or whatever it can spend and therefore generate demand but the problem is that where does the government get resources for spending it can get its resources in three possible ways one is at the expense of the workers in the advanced country working people here at the expense of the working people it can get its resources at the expense of the capitalists or the or those who live off the surplus or it can get its resources not at the expense of any of these but simply by what is called borrowing which means enlarging the fiscal deficit printing more notes if necessary now if the government gets its resources from the working people they as i said more or less consume everything that they get anyway so suppose their suppose 100 rupees of taxes are raised from them their consumption goes down by 100 rupees so even if the government spends these 100 rupees there is no net increase in demand someone's consumption has gone down someone's demand has gone down government's demand has gone up so if the government is to increase employment then it can do so only if either it taxes the rich or the capitalists or the surplus earners or if it in fact uh, uses a larger fiscal deficit both these are ruled out because of the domination of globalized finance 
the fact of finance being opposed to greater taxes on the rich is not very surprising because the financiers are among the richest anyway. So, if you tax the rich, you are taxing them. They don't like it, obviously. On the other hand, they also don't like fiscal deficits. Larger fiscal deficit finance does not like. As a matter of fact, there was a very recent illustration of this. In Britain, a lady called Liz Truss became prime minister just for a few days. During that period, Liz Truss, her finance minister, produced a budget. In the budget, there was a larger fiscal deficit, which was used for making transfers to the capitalists. So the government was borrowing money in order to hand over that money to the capitalists. This, you would have thought, is something that the capitalists would like, financiers would like, but financiers don't like the idea of government borrowing more money. Therefore, Liz Truss, her government, there was a revolt of finance against her government because of which it fell in just a few days. So, finance does not like fiscal deficits, which by the way is why we have Fiscal Responsibility Act. I remember when I used to be in Kerala, our government had actually opposed that Fiscal Responsibility Act because the preceding government had actually brought in such an act. We, we, we did away with it. Because why Fiscal Responsibility Act? Because that is the demand of finance. Okay? So if the government wants to be in the good books of finance, if it believes in a neoliberal regime, then it has to have these kinds of acts. So, the only two ways of financing government expenditure are both ruled out as far as the neoliberal regime is concerned. Therefore, there is nothing to combat the tendency towards crisis. And that's why I called it an existential crisis. There is, you know, there is no way you can maneuver out of this situation. While this crisis is continuing, imperialism has got into another situation which it never visualized. You see, when the Second World War was ending, the imperialist countries and the Soviet Union met in a conference in a place called Yalta. In the Yalta conference, the imperialist countries told the Soviet Union that we are not going to move towards Eastern Europe, provided you don't do anything in destabilizing our governments in Western Europe. Stalin agreed. Many people are critical of Stalin because, because of this Yalta conference, this agreement, the Soviet Union did not support the Greek Revolution, which, which broke out immediately after the Second World War, and the Greek Revolution was crushed by the imperialist countries. Many people are critical. But anyway, what it actually meant is that imperialism did not make encroachments into Eastern Europe. When the Soviet Union collapsed, Gorbachev told the Americans and the Germans and so on, and got a promise from, from them that they are not going to move towards Eastern Europe. That NATO is going not to expand towards the former Soviet countries. But the moment the Soviet Union had collapsed, the neocons in America actually started a push towards Eastern Europe. Every country that had been a part of the Soviet Union in the old days, almost every country, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland, or, you know, Warsaw Pact countries, Poland, Hungary, they all became members of NATO. And the last country, Soviet Union, Russia could do, could do nothing, but the last country which tried to become a member of NATO, at which point Russia started raising objections, was Ukraine. Now, in Ukraine, there was a president elected by the people 
who wanted to maintain good relations both with Russia and with the West called Viktor Yanukovych. But in 2014, the Americans supported, financed, staged a coup d'etat in Ukraine to get rid of Yanukovych and to install in his place a man who had been supportive of the fascists in the Second World War. Very right-wing government. That right-wing government then, then decided to launch an offensive against the Russian-speaking people in eastern Ukraine, and they naturally then revolted. A civil war erupted. In that civil war, 14,000 people were killed. And of course, when that civil war was really big, in order to settle the civil war, agreements were reached in a place called Minsk, called Minsk Agreements. The Minsk Agreements with Russia solemnly agreed to, but Western countries, in fact, rejected the Minsk Agreement, which had been agreed to between Germany, France, Russia, and Ukraine. Minsk Agreement was torpedoed at the behest of the Americans and the British, and as a result, Russia had to intervene, and that intervention has given rise to the Ukraine war as we know it. Now, basic belief was, on the part of imperialism, that look, if we impose sanctions on Russia, if we make sure that Russia cannot export its commodities, Russia, in fact, is an exporter of natural gas, the world's largest exporter of natural gas, and it exports natural gas to Germany. So if we can make sure that Germany doesn't buy natural gas from Russia, if we can make sure that as far as Russia's own foreign exchange reserves, which are held with various banks all over the world, are not made available to Russia, in that case, that economy would collapse. They can't carry on with the war. That was the thinking. In fact, the phrase was that we shall reduce the ruble to rubble. That basically the ruble would become like dust. But that hasn't happened. On the contrary, Russian natural, R R Russia, its exports continue. Russia has got a ruble value, which is really no less than what it was before all these sanctions began. So Russia has not been defeated even on the economic terrain. The hope that Russia would be defeated in the economic terrain has really been dashed. At the same time, it is well known that the Ukrainian counteroffensive is making no headway at all. Why has Russia not been defeated? And this is where I want to discuss some of the, you, you know, there's a lot of talk these days about multipolarity. If you really look at the international literature, they talk about the fact that, that okay, imperialism of the Western kind is now retreating, but what you have is the emergence of multipolarity that new poles like Russia and China are coming up, and that is the change taking place in the world. But I have been arguing that that is really a wrong way of looking at it. Of course, countries like China and Russia have come up, but that's a wrong way of looking at it. Fundamentally, what is happening is an opposition to imperialism in the entire third world, that it is the people's struggles, the reason why Russia's exports have not suffered is because Russia exports to India. India has not cut down Russian imports from Russia. Russia exports to China. Russia exports to Middle East. Russia exports to other countries. And what is more, even Europe is taking Russian goods via India. And that's the way that Mr. Rabbanis have made a fortune for themselves. They actually buy Russian goods and, and sell it in Europe. So, it is the revolt of the third world which is responsible for the fact that Russia has not collapsed. In fact, it has overwhelming support among the African countries. It has overwhelming support in the third world. And that is why 
we have to look at the crisis of imperialism in terms of a crisis which is vis-a-vis -vis the global south and also vis-a-vis -vis its own domestic working class rather than getting trapped in all this talk about unipolarity versus multipolarity. In this situation, there is in fact a new wave of resistance that is building up. The resistance of the workers in, the, in, in Europe and so on is well known. Italian workers do not load arms to Ukraine. German workers are against Germany getting involved in that war. Spanish workers similarly are opposed to goods being sent to Ukraine to prolong the war. That is one part of the story. The other part is that in Africa, I mentioned decolonization earlier. In Africa, decolonization itself had never been completed. You know, in India, we were decolonized in the sense that at least no British troops remained. Indian government was allowed to pursue whatever economic policy it would like to pursue. But in a large part of Africa, particularly Western Africa, French troops in former French colonies, French troops remain in those countries which were earlier colonies. And they have all been drawn into an economic union with France in which they cannot really industrialize. How can you industrialize if you cannot protect your industry? If you cannot protect your industry and it's cheaper to buy French goods than your own goods which have not that much experience in production. So, they have continued to remain underdeveloped because French colonialism has not actually gone. It remains in terms of its troops and so on and in terms of its economic regime. If you have an economic u union, you cannot pursue any fiscal policy you like. You cannot pursue any monetary policy you like because that is something that is going to subvert the union and so you, it has to be cleared by France. So political decolonization itself was never completed in Francophone Africa. Now that being the case, many countries in Francophone Africa, when they would have government saying, no, no, we want French troops out, the French would either stage a coup d'etat or would indirectly get the head of state murdered and so on. This, I'm not saying this uh, just like that, very well known Marxist revolutionary in Burkina Faso called Thomas Sankara. Now Thomas Sankara wanted French troops out of Burkina Faso and his own follower, one of his own followers was allegedly bribed to kill him and he did and became president in his place and the French troops remained. A lot of the Governments in West Africa, therefore, are governments which have been, this, even when their electoral processes have been planted there by imperialists, by France, by the United States. Against this, the nationalist sentiments, the patriotic sentiments, often arise within the army. Now, recently, because of such sentiments within the army, there have been military coups in Guinea, in Mali, in Burkina Faso, and recently in Niger. All these countries are telling France, remove your troops. Now obviously, Niger also has 1,100 American troops. So if you have French and American troops which are asked to leave, naturally imperialism doesn't sit quiet. So there is talk of military intervention against the Nigerian government, against the Niger government, and what is more, you actually now have, if not direct military intervention, military intervention by some puppet regimes of West Africa itself against the Niger government. And Mali and Burkina Faso, they have said, if there is such intervention, that we are going to send troops to defend the current government in Niger. So West Africa is on a powder keg 
war can break out any time there just as you have a war in ukraine these are all these are all proxy wars war in ukraine is not between russia and zelensky is in russia and nato war in west africa would not be between those countries and niger and burkina faso it would be between niger and burkina faso and imperialism therefore imperialism is getting involved in wars all over the world in defending its turf therefore the point is that there is a challenge which imperialism is facing the like of which it has never faced and in this challenge which it is facing you have the advanced country workers not supporting it as a matter of fact something very peculiar is happening the advanced in the advanced countries in the imperialist countries political parties that oppose the war are the fascist parties now this is not to say that the fascist parties are really opposed to war they oppose war in order to get popular sympathy and when they get elected they continue to support the war this has happened in italy a person called meloni leader of a fascist coalition got elected because of her opposition to the war but having got elected she showed her true colors by in fact continuing to support the war in italy is a part of the nato coalition in germany since all the mainstream parties are all supportive of the war of nato's war in ukraine the only party other than a segment of the left the only party that opposes it is actually a nazi party called afd now afd's vote share is going up so if the working class is getting betrayed by the social democrats by its own traditional leadership many in the working class then veer towards fascism which is what is happening so imperialism as i said is fighting a war that does not have the support of the working class to what extent the left revives itself to take on an anti war position and therefore reduce the nazi vote remains to be seen but fundamentally this is a war in which the imperialist countries do not have the support of their own workers as a matter of fact imperialism now does not have the support of the working class in its various ventures and at the same time in the third world there is there is a desire for new arrangements because the new liberal arrangement has failed india is having agreements with united arab emirates china is having agreements with brazil and what are these agreements for these agreements are to bypass the use of the dollar that basically china would sell goods to brazil brazil would get set sell goods to china and they would settle it amongst themselves no use of any dollar so there is an attempt to bypass the dollar to remove dollar from its hegemonic role in world trade so as as i said imperialism is cornered today as never before this does not mean that imperialism is collapsing no that we should not have such illusions imperialism doesn't collapse it has to be overthrown but what i'm saying is that the conditions for peoples rising up to overthrow imperialism are ripening because there is no way out as far as the current situation is concerned for imperialism and this situation itself is extremely unsatisfactory from its point of view thank you very much